Dr. Mulligan as well for, for coming in to us. Sorry, is this not working or the wrong mic is on? No. Okay. Perfect. Sorry, just I know the sound doesn't always pick up if anyone is listening in. And um, thanks very much for coming in and for your your both the briefing document and the the opening statement. And it's actually a point in your briefing document that I wanted to ask you about in relation to. Um, you say there's been some criticism of the choice to use post-birth rather than pre-birth orders and that you disagree with this criticism. The problem with the pre-birth model is that it creates a situation whereby at the point when a surrogate gives birth to the baby, she has no legal rights whatsoever in respect of that baby. And I just wanted to know if you could maybe expand on that, explain that out, because I suppose there's another school of thought that the pre-birth order is a better maybe system in terms of well from a logistical point of view and also from I suppose that's the whole idea of surrogacy so I'd just be interested to hear a little bit more on that if you could expand on that point um, now and just to say I would totally agree that um, you know it's really important for a woman to have bodily autonomy but I think that there is some jurisdictions I'm, I'm potentially wrong on this but I think in Canada that up until the point of birth Obviously, the woman who is pregnant has the total bodily autonom autonomy and then the parentage is transferred straight away. Mm -hmm. So I'm just wondering, just to tease out a little bit more in relation to that, and, and I just found that interesting um, in your document, and if you could expand on that firstly, please. Thanks. Thanks, yeah, that's a really interesting point. So uh, this, is, this is a tricky question. So there, is, there are some people, as you say, who are in favour of a post-birth model, which is what's in the domestic legislation, at the, with the proposed legislation at the moment. There are other people who are in favour of a pre-birth model. So just to explain a bit about what a pre-birth model looks like is you, and this is very common in US states, so Massachusetts, California, possibly Colorado. Um, but basically you go into court and before the child is born, um, and essentially you then re, re, you reattribute parentage between the people involved before the child is born. So when the woman gives birth, the child is not her child. Okay, um, I have a difficulty with that because I, you know, you have to you have to make a rule about who is the parent. Okay. I have a difficulty with a legal situation, which is the situation in those jurisdictions whereby that woman has no legal rights whatsoever in relation to that child she has just given birth to. So like literally that child leaves her body, she has just given birth like any woman gives birth, and there's no legal relationship between them. That woman is in a vulnerable position. Um, obviously she is a self-determining autonomous person who's made this decision, but still she has gone through what is always a difficult experience in any circumstances. I think it's problematic for her to have no legal rights whatsoever to that, to the, to that child. Um, and I think that the situation whereby she has none is, is very, very problematic. And I mentioned in the briefing document, you know, especially in this country with this country's history of uh, difficult adoptions, potentially adoptions with a lack of consent, you know, we, we have to be very careful about how we deal with these parentage issues. Um, I think that a, a good compromise, however, I, I'm not saying that the intended parents should have no legal rights either, right? This is the difficulty. Who gets the legal rights at the point of birth? I think that a good compromise is that the, le that, 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 that the intended parents have at least some guardianship rights. So I do see a difficulty with a situation whereby the birth mother is the mother and the intended parents have no legal rights at all. That, that's a problem. But I think a good compromise is where they are at least appointed guardians and then you gradually, you, you then at, at a point later than that, you transfer parentage. Um, and I think that that's a good compromise. I think that is, does appear to be in the legislation as it's drafted at the moment, but it's not terribly clear. So I would, I would like to see that more clear in the ultimate uh, version of the bill, um, if it does go through. Um, so yes, yeah, that's a, a yeah. supplementary to that, sorry. Um, like obviously surrogacy is totally different than adoption. And do you not think that in a situation where it's regulated and people know exactly the arrangement they're entering into that there should be no question of to whether that person would want a legal right over the baby that they've are you saying that that's in case they change their mind well to some extent i mean all surrogacy arrangements you you have to consider the problem of surrogates changing their mind right that's always going to be a risk in surrogacy it very rarely happens in fact, it's more common that the commissioning parents will change their minds. And yeah, and that's why the yeah. whole pre-birth model yeah. can be a good thing because... But, yeah. Absolutely. So one advantage of the pre-birth model is that surrogates say, well, I don't want to be left with this baby. 
yeah. you know, I, I didn't, I never wanted to have this baby for myself. Absolutely, that, yeah. that is a difficulty. But it's a tricky situation. I don't think that the pre-birth model, I think it's, it's too blunt an instrument to deal with that situation. So you, I think a better approach is to have a situation whereby the birth mother is still the, is still the mother at birth, the, the parents, the, the intending parents are guardians. Uh, and you can, you can have a situation whereby they cannot divest themselves of rights to the child, but she can. So, you know, it's, it's a little bit more nuanced looking, but it doesn't, a model that doesn't have pre-birth orders doesn't mean the surrogate has to get left with the child. Uh, and, that, and that is a real difficulty. Um, but I think more broadly as well, you have to bear in mind that all surrogacy legislation has to contemplate this problem of surrogates changing their mind. It will always be a possible issue, rare but possible. Okay, so you have to think, what do we do in that scenario? But parental orders can never deal with that. Parental orders are fundamentally for consensual based situations, you know? The courts will always have to step in where there's a dispute. The state mm -hmm. will usually have to step in where there's a dispute. There is no easy solution to the change your mind scenario, you know? So a pre-birth order, you still have to find some way to, to square that very, very difficult situation if there is a change of mind. But I would say that that's why it has to be 100% as much as possible, really regulated, really, uh, you know, I think in the, they, they talk about counselling and beforehand and everything in some countries. Uh, it has to be like as much as we can not have a situation like that, because I think I would be worried that if we're, if we're entering into a legislation with the mindset that somebody potentially will change their mind, mm -hmm. that we're in a really not a good place. And what, yeah. I mean, that's not their genetic child either. So where does that leave? I'm just, I find that, found that very interesting in your, mm -hmm. in your, and I think it's good. I think it's good to have these discussions, but I suppose I would just be, I would be nervous of us having that situation yeah. because I think it is totally different than adoption and you're in, in a totally different space. And I, I would say the vast majority of people know that entering into mm -hmm. that agreement and as you say, are actually more likely to be saying, well, we don't want to be mm -hmm. potentially left in a situation where we're going to have to care for this yeah. baby that we, we weren't in, intended on having and is actually not, you know, genetically related to us. But I just wanted to kind of tease that out a bit more. But what, mm -hmm. what would you then, can I just ask one in relation to... Can I just say one thing in response yeah, yeah, to that ahead, just before yeah. you ask the next question? Like, I absolutely agree with that, right? And yeah. I'm not saying that you know, that you shouldn't have pre-birth orders and therefore if the surrogate changes their mind, she gets to keep the child and that's it. That's obviously not just either. But you have to find some way to, essentially you'll have to make a best interest assessment after the child is born. The courts will have to step in in that change of mind scenario. Um, you know, of course I'm not saying that the genetic parents should just have no access to the child and, and it should not be their child. That's certainly not what I'm saying. But equally, a situation whereby the surrogate, who has gestated the child, who is She's not nothing to the child, you know, and I think that's yeah. really important. No, yeah, it's really, really important to look at, you know, this this idea of, of the of the gestator as just kind of like a carrier, as just a container. She's absolutely not. You know, she she is someone who grew that baby, who gestated that baby. She's very important. And ethical surrogacy regulation fundamentally must acknowledge that. And part of how it does that is by looking fairly at this question of pre-birth and post-birth orders and looking at questions of identity as well, you know? So I think you, you really have to be in surrogacy, you really have to be aware of this narrative that the gestator is just a container, that she's just a vessel, you know? Because that is, it's not what she is, fundamentally. Yeah, and I would totally mm. agree with that. And I don't think by advocating a pre-birth order that you would be kind of advocating that position. Um, but I suppose, where would you see the, the potential solution? In that. As I say, I think I would be in favour of when the child is born, I think the intended parents and the birth mother should all have some legal rights to the child. And ultimately those rights will, if, if they disagree, which they don't usually, those rights will have to be adjudicated upon by a court. You'll always have to go to a court with that situation. Uh, in my view, you'll have to look at the best interest of the child. Um, so some kind of compromise whereby she is a, par she is a parent of the child but the commissioning parents are guardians or potentially parents as well. There's no reason that a child only has to have two parents, you know. Um, so I think you need to ensure that everyone at the point of birth has some legal standing. Um, and you then, you then make sure everyone has legal rights that if they disagree, 
the courts will ultimately have to resolve that dispute. But I do think pre-birth orders, and you know, I'm, I'm not the only person that has difficulties with pre-birth orders. There are uh, a lot of advocates that, that have problems with them. Apart from, from the perspective of the woman, it's very important to have a post-birth best interest analysis of the child. So, for example, the UN Special Rapporteur's reports on this, which I mentioned in my uh, briefing document, have expressed concerns about pre-birth orders because they they decide the child's destiny before the child is born. There's no there's no subsequent court process whereby the interests of the child are considered. So from both the perspective of the child and the surrogate, pre-birth orders are, are a little bit tricky. Okay. okay Can I just ask yeah. that that sort of position where you would have both the parents and guardians, how long would you think that would need to be in place for? I think it could be very short. I mean, usually in the, uh, I think, I'm not totally sure in the legislation, but essentially until you go and go, go through the, the court process, ordinarily what legislation will allow for is a period of time when the surrogate can object, when she can raise an objection essentially. And you just need to make sure that that period is not like when she's still in hospital and still potentially under the effects of anesthesia and you know very, very vulnerable. You just need to make sure that there is a period of time. Um, and that can be a short period of time, but I think it, it has to be a period. And, and all surrogacy re regimes will generally allow for a period of time during which she can object. Um, and, and the international human rights documents, so the UN Special Rapporteur's views, would also uh, suggest that that's very important to allow that period of, of recovery from birth for the surrogate to form a view. Okay, thank you. Thanks very much, uh, Luck. Um I just want to say as well, I found this really good, like both the contributions from members and from yourself, Dr Mulligan, and it's the whole purpose of, of this committee. So it's great, and it's actually great to have a little bit of extra time to kind of get into some of the more nitty gritty of it. Um, just out of curiosity, following on from the earlier discussion, do you, is there any data that you're aware of, of situations where a surrogate changed their mind? Or is there any like, cases mm -hmm. or, or kind of landmark court cases or anything like that. And then the other question I have is just, I'm kind of asking this to a lot of people who come in, is there models um, in other countries or whether that's certain states in America that, that you think uh, are maybe best practice or that you think that we should be, be looking at? Mm -hmm. Thanks. Thanks, yeah, great questions. I mean, I, a problem with surrogacy generally is an absence of data. So often okay. you're just dealing with court decisions. Um, and a problem when you're just looking at court decisions is you, you're often only dealing with ones that are actually litigated as opposed to settled outside of court. Um, it, so it's very hard to get to the nub of how many surrogacy arrangements would actually go wrong. It's possible that the Human Fertilisation and Embryology Authority in the UK might have statistics on it, um, but I, I'm actually not sure that it does. Um, essentially, the, the overall understanding is that there are there are not that many that go wrong. That you know, your overwhelming majority of surrogacy arrangements go as planned, and there are a small number. But you do come across like headline cases, like the original. The, I think the first one, the first US cases, was called the Baby M case. That's one of these change of mind cases. But it involves a traditional surrogate, i.e., somebody who was genetically related to the child. Okay. Which is, which as I understand it, is completely off the table here. Yeah. Uh, and that also that also changes the data a little bit because historically traditional surrogacy was much more common, and interestingly in the UK is still quite common. So you you probably it's it's more likely that you'll have a change of mind there because yeah. you know the woman is genetically related. Yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah. that confounds the data a little bit in terms of where the, the, there's really really good data coming out of the there's a family research centre at the University of Cambridge and they do like a they're doing like a longitudinal study of children born through surrogacy. Okay. Um, so you know they have they kind of look at them at age seven, age twelve, etc. And, and there's brilliant data from them. So they're really good on identity and, and all those issues. I think they but. They, they probably don't deal with people who change their mind because the people who are in really disputed situations don't necessarily then want to go and be involved in a longitudinal study about surrogacy. Yeah. So I guess my answer is it's very hard to know, um, yeah. but people think a small number. Nice. Yeah. Um, and then, sorry, the other point, uh, the, other, the other question was models of surrogacy. So yeah, a difficulty is that not that many states regulate it um, and... I suppose some states only regulate it domestically and don't allow foreigners to, to, to avail themselves of it at all. Some states actively do allow foreigners, and I, this is delicate, but there may be an intention to draw in kind of surrogacy tourism if they do that. Um, so you don't necessarily, those models may not be what you necessarily want to, to model the law 
Um, my own view is that the, the English model is, is quite good. It's, it's okay. been working for a long time. Um, and as I said, a really great feature of the English model is that um, you know, open surrogacy was the default. Like, it's very common for people to know their surrogates well. And that's, there are surrogacy agencies, a lot of non-profit surrogacy agencies in the UK that will like, match people up with their surrogate. And they're, they've always advocated a position of openness, yeah. which is an interesting contrast to donor-assisted reproduction, where when that started out, the general practice was that you would not tell the child they were donor conceived. Whereas the culture in surrogacy has always been more towards openness. And that's, to my mind, a very, very good thing. Yeah. So I think there's a lot to be learned there from, I guess, from the practice as well as from the law in the UK. Thanks. Thanks, Chair. Okay, thank, thank you very much, Chair. And thanks very much as well for, for the presentations. I just want to firstly say I was glad to read your point in relation to the funding because I felt that last week that although it wasn't being maybe explicitly said by the Department of Health, but there certainly was, uh, you know, a, kind of an inclination being made that, you know, potentially this committee and the work that we have to do would delay the AHR bill when I think pre-led scrutiny was 2017. And as mm -hmm. it was said in your document, it was 2019 was the last time there was any discussions with yourselves and some of the stakeholders. So I think it was a bit disingenuous of them last week to try and... Um, indicate that all of a sudden there's this big panic on it, you know, just because this committee is, is in place. Um, so I just wanted to, I have no questions in relation to that, I just wanted to say I, I was glad to see that. Um, in relation to the pre-birth, this discussion we had earlier, pre-birth versus, I was glad to see in your document, it's the, the view I share of either at birth or at pre-birth. Um, I just wondered, I know you have some information in relation to that, but just from your own practical experience, is there reasons why you, you would um, kind of advocate a pre-birth or, or at-birth uh, parental link? Um, then I have a really practical question, which I think I might know the answer to, but I just want to ask it. In relation to a surrogate having previous pregnancies, is that obviously just to see that how somebody's health and well-being is during a pregnancy? I just wanted to ask that practical question. Um, I also wanted to just make the point that in your list of expenses, I was glad to see that you mentioned childcare and that you mentioned life insurance, because I think there are things that maybe are sometimes overlooked and that were um, really good points. So I just kind of wanted to agree with, I really thought that the briefing document was very, very good. I agree with a huge amount of the information. So I don't have a lot of questions, but just that around, because I find that very interesting, the pre-birth, post-birth, at-birth, parental situation. And I really think we need to be trying to advocate a model for, for pre-birth. I think it just, I think it's in the best interest of, of everybody, to be honest. Um, so just reviews on that. Then the previous pregnancies. Um, and I think, I think that's all for, for questions for now. Thanks, Chair. Okay, thank you. Um, so the, the, the pre-birth, post-birth, um, assignment of legal parentage is obviously a very controversial thing and different people, you know, yeah. different international bodies, lawyers have, have very different um, opinions on it. I suppose as a more lay person, and, uh, you know, doctor dealing with people, but I think most lay people as well feel that the whole idea of surrogacy is that the intending parents are going yeah. to be the legal parents and the surrogate isn't going to be the legal parent. And for the vast majority of cases, and again, it comes back to the importance of counselling and, you know, that for the vast majority of surrogacy arrangements, that's what happens. And there are some small number where there may be conflict. Um, I think, as the speaker in the previous session said, there will always be situations where things will have to go to court. Um, and, you know, there, prob there possibly will be cases in the future where there is a dispute. I suppose my feeling about the legislation, the way it's drafted at the moment, is that it is all drafted... So that the intention of the whole procedure is that the legal, the intending parents will be the legal parents, but the legislation is drafted the opposite way, that, that the surrogate, even though that's not the intention of anyone involved, that the surrogate will be the legal parent, and that then it's up to the intending parents to, to, to apply for a parentage, and, you know, if there's a dispute, they have to, um, they have to, to go to court over that dispute. I'm not a lawyer and I may be being simplistic, but if it was even directed the other way, that the intending parents were the 
the legal parents from birth, but if the surrogate had an issue that there was a mechanism for her to apply to the courts and to contest it, that might be... It just, it just seems illogical to, that the whole intention is that the, legal, totally the intending agree. parents yeah. are, the, are the legal parents, but the law is saying the opposite. Yeah. It just doesn't make sense to me. Um, from a medical point of view, um, surrogacy pregnancies are similar to donor egg pregnancies because the woman who is pregnant is not carrying her own egg. She's got the intending, the intending woman's mother's egg. Um, and we know that donor egg pregnancies are a little bit more complicated. There's a higher incidence of um, high blood pressure, bleeding problems, and a higher incidence of, of being uh, delivered prematurely. So I was talking to some paediatric colleagues um, in the last few days about this. Um, so uh, there is a higher incidence of those babies ending up in intensive care in hospitals and decisions having to be made about their care. Um, some of them are very healthy, go home straight away, but and during that critical time, it really seems wrong that the intending parents who are going to be the legal parents don't have the right to, to make those decisions over that child's care. Um, um, so that's so. My feeling would be that that, and I think that certainly that was the feeling, as I said in my paper, of yeah. eighty five percent, and and those were GPs, obstetricians, and other people working in in IVF, roughly split, eighty or ninety in each group. Um, they all, you know, eighty four percent felt it should be assigned at birth. Um, in the draft legislation, it says that the um, the surrogate can can agree for the child to go to live, to reside with the, the intending parents from birth. But it, it doesn't say what happens if she refuses to do that. And, you know, I think, again, things like early bonding, skin to skin contact with the baby is really important. From, and there are medical reasons, you know, things as well, um, reasons why it's very important for children from the very earliest stage of their development. Uh, to bond with their parents, it helps bonding. And particularly in a case like surrogacy, where where the intending mother hasn't been pregnant and she hasn't been, you know, feeling the baby move and her partner yeah. hasn't been feeling the baby move. And, you know, it's really important for bonding for them and for the baby that they get their baby as soon as possible and that it is their baby as soon as possible. Um, um, what was the other? Sorry, I'm the other one was just about the previous uh, pregnancy. Previous, yeah. Is that just that, like that, a, again, is a very good practical. Question. Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> I suppose again, come, there's a medical reason for that. That you know, yeah. if, before, if, unless any of us has been pregnant, we don't know whether we're going to have a complicated pregnancy or an uncomplicated pregnancy. And some women develop complications during pregnancy. Some women, on their, and th those are more common in a first pregnancy. So again, things like high blood pressure and needing to be delivered early. Um, I have seen cases where women have, on their first pregnancy, have ended up with a major hemorrhage and lost their uterus, and they can't carry another pregnancy again. So I suppose if you know that, so again, it's coming back to protecting the surrogate. Yeah. Um, if you know that the surrogate has had uncomplicated pregnancies before, then it's very likely that she'll have an uncomplicated pregnancy again. But you don't want her to have a really complicated first pregnancy that affects her chances of having a healthy pregnancy for herself in the future yeah, if she doesn't course. have any children. Um, there, from a, an emotional, a psychological point of view, it is difficult because I've been at a, a fem you know, a, a, another webinar a year or two ago where there was a very strong argument, how dare you tell us that it, how dare you tell me if I haven't had a baby that I can't be a surrogate for somebody else. So there is an issue about personal autonomy as well. And is it right for me as a doctor or for us as legislators to say that somebody who hasn't had a baby can't be a surrogate for somebody else? It is a, a difficult ethical question. Um, you know, and I can yeah. see the, the, the arguments in favour of that, but I suppose from a medical point of view, I think it is, it is important that the, that the surrogate is somebody who, who's not, that we try and avoid complications for the surrogate in yeah. the future. Um, well, thanks very thank much. You. I just want to say I really agree with the thing about the, the pre-birth parental situation. I think it's so important and, and I would be fearful if we don't have that in place, that we're going into this in a very unusual kind of frame of mind. I think it's really important like that, you know, that as you're saying, everybody understands with surrogacy that the intention is that the intended parents are the parents. And I just think it's by having like a pre-birth order, I think that's, that's definitely the way forward. So I was glad to see that. And it's interesting to see that the vast majority of the medical profession 
agree with that too. So thanks for that. Sorry, I just I forgot one thing. I, yeah. just, um, the, the, I think it also protects the surrogate because yeah. there has been a case in Thailand that everybody knows about where, you know, an Australian couple had twins via surrogacy and one, one of the twins had a serious genetic problem and, and that couple didn't want to take the baby home and left the baby with the surrogate in Thailand. So I think from the surrogate's point of view, it protects the surrogate as well because... Yeah. Um, what happens to the surrogate if the, if, the if the intending parents decide they don't want the child anymore? So I, I think for all reasons, and, and again, this, you know, if the, if the surrogate has been counselled prior to the pregnancy and knows that exactly. this is the situation, yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, and I suppose there are worries that the surrogate, you know, in the, in the days after, after childbirth, that she may be emotionally or medically not fit. So to me, that even strengthens the argument for making the decision prior to birth and before the whole thing starts. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks, Chair. Okay. Thank you.